Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the OneTouch brand, providing diabetes management solutions for people living with diabetes, including the OneTouch Vario Flex blood glucose meter and the OneTouch Reveal mobile app. Taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hey, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. You know I'm not a doctor. And if you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, happy Thanksgiving. But however you celebrate, let's face it, holidays and food can cause some stress for a lot of people with diabetes. I'd get the looks, I'd get the you shouldn't, I'd get the I made this for you, and then I'd feel guilted into having to eat the sugar-free whatever because it was made for me. And I did the polite thing for like three or four years. And then it got to the point where I was like, I'm not doing this. There's 12 pies in the kitchen, and I don't (laughs) want the sugar-free cherry pie. Like, I don't like cherry. You'll hear from a round table of adults with type 1 and one parent, me, about the pitfalls of Thanksgiving and about ways to make it work. There's some great advice and a lot of laughter here. Shop Talk this week with a company called Tempramed. They've got a product that can keep insulin pens cold. And another group called Drawn from Valor, an animation studio helping out nonprofits with a really great diabetes story. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of the podcast. Really glad to have you along just a couple of days before Thanksgiving. If you're new to the show, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connections. We talk to celebrities and athletes, you know, leaders in our community, as well as people who don't have a blog or never going to write a book, but are doing their best and working hard to live life well with diabetes. My son was diagnosed almost 11 years ago now, right before he turned two. He is almost 13. My husband has type 2 diabetes. I have a broadcasting background, radio and and television and local markets and put that all together. And that is how you get the podcast. It may go without saying that most people with diabetes, whatever kind of diabetes, have a complicated relationship with food. And most of us, with or without diabetes, have a complicated relationship with family. So when you put the two together on a holiday like Thanksgiving, uh, you know, there's some tension, there's a lot of well-meaning people, and there's just got to be ways to handle this better. So I was thrilled that these folks would come together, talk to me, do a roundtable, and uh, you'll hear from them in just a moment. I, I knew we'd get great advice. I didn't know we would have so much fun. They were just great. And these are all people that I met at the Diabetes Unconference and the Weekend for Women, two great conferences that were held together earlier this fall. I do also have to give credit to Mike Lawson. Uh, Many of you may know Mike uh, from Diabetes Hands Foundation, from other podcasts and and blogs, and he's done. He's he's just a terrific personality um, who lives with type 1. And I say personality, I will link up the video that really got me started thinking about diabetes and Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. It's very funny. It's quick. It's light. You may want to send it two people that you'll be seeing later this week. It really gets to the point of how the people who love us may not understand us, uh, but they want to help. And the best way, Mike says, to address that is to just be frank with them and let them call you pookie, but communicate that you can uh, eat what you want to eat. And I will link up that video at diabetes-connections.com and in the show notes uh, for the episode. Quick word from our sponsor from One Touch. They've been a trusted brand in blood glucose management for more than 30 years. This year, U.S. News and World Report named One Touch the number one pharmacist recommended in blood glucose monitoring devices and lancets based on a survey of pharmacists nationwide. Find out more about the One Touch brand products at diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Touch logo. If you live near Tampa, Florida, I'm going to be heading down your way in early December, uh, less than a week and a half now as this podcast airs, for a JDRF Summit. I am so excited to head down there. My aunt lives there. We've actually had my aunt on the show. She has a great new grandparents group because I have a cousin, her grandson. 
he's my second cousin. I don't know. Um, but he has type one. He is uh, 15. And he was diagnosed a couple of years after my son. So I'm really excited to see her. There's a couple of really great speakers for this event, including Dr. Ponder, who is, you know, of sugar surfing fame, and Caroline Marshall, who I have not met yet. She is a special agent with the FBI. So you know I'm going to track her down and try to find out more about her story. That is pretty cool. I'm talking at this event about social media, and I'll be posting a little bit more about this in the Diabetes Connections Facebook group. If you haven't joined yet, very easy to find. It is called Diabetes Connections, the group on Facebook, and I link to it in all the show notes and on the website. Just request to join because I'm trying to find ways to better communicate with you guys. And this has really seemed to be a nice way where Facebook lets us talk to each other. The page is still great. It'll still be there. But it's it's sometimes hard to have conversations. And I want to get your feedback on this. I'll be posting about this after the show is airing. What do you think of Facebook? Do you get really good support on social media? Do you get good medical advice? Do you take medical advice? Do you ask for it? Do you give it? I mean, to me, this is a really interesting topic. So I will be speaking more about it here on the show, um, especially after I do the presentation. It's the first time I'm doing this one about, basically, it's about using social media well to thrive with diabetes and not become more fearful than you need to, because I have seen a sea change. I mean, I've been in this world only 11 years. And um, of course, there was no Facebook back then. And while it has connected us in ways that I think are incredible and invaluable, it's also created a bunch of urban legends and misinformation and some fear that really did not seem to be there before. So I'm interested to get your take, and I'll let you know how it goes. Thanksgiving Roundtable coming up. First, a quick word from Dexcom. And as you know, we've been dealing with type 1 for 11 years now in December. Benny was diagnosed in 2006, just before he turned two. I'd heard about the teen years, but like a lot of parents, I thought we would be different. Well, here comes some incredible physical changes and wild hormone swings. And honestly, I cannot imagine managing diabetes during this crazy time without the Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. We react more quickly to highs and lows, adjusting insulin doses with advice from our endocrinologist. It's been amazing. I know the G5 Mobile is helping to improve Benny's A1C. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Thanksgiving has always been my holiday. Um, Most of my family will come to me because I always had to work. When you start out in broadcasting, you rarely get holidays off, and I always had to work on Thanksgiving. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my broadcasting adventures about Thanksgiving. Funny story, but I'll I'll do it after the roundtable. It's kind of embarrassing, but I know you want to talk about diabetes first. So stay tuned. Uh, Right after the roundtable, I will tell you about Lord help me, the dancing taco. Okay, I am joined by four adults who have type 1. Kim Hislop, Mike Barry, Jennifer Christensen, and Naya Grant. We started talking about when they were diagnosed. You'll get to know them more. They will introduce themselves here. I am thrilled that they agreed to come on and share some personal stuff and some fun stuff about Thanksgiving. I really hope it helps you. I I do have to point out um, little audio issues here and there. I mean, we had four people on the call, five people, including me. Just here and there, uh, there's a little bit of a scratching noise, which I think is somebody's uh, headphone wire maybe hitting their microphone, but it's fine and it gets better. So stick with it. I am thrilled that these four agreed to come on and share some personal stuff and some fun stuff about Thanksgiving. And I really hope it helps you have a great holiday. Kim and Mike and Jennifer and Naya, thank you for being with me today. I, I really appreciate it. Not a problem. It's our pleasure. All right. Let's just go around and introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. Share with us how long pretty much you've lived with diabetes, you know, if you were diagnosed as a kid or an adult, and what you do for Thanksgiving, if you go and have a big family meal, if it's a, if you travel, if you stay home. Kim, let's start with you. I have um, had diabetes for 20 years. I was diagnosed at the age of 15, and um, for the past 12 years, I've gone with my husband to his family's Thanksgiving gathering, which consists of 
anywhere between 35 and 50 people on any Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and mostly it's a lot of cousins and um, extended family. So it's a very big gathering. It can be overwhelming. Lots of food. Do you come from a big family yourself or was that something new for you? I do have a large family, but uh, growing up mostly for Thanksgiving, it was just my sister and I with our parents and sometimes like a grandparent thrown in there or (laughs) aunts and uncles, but never more than six to eight people. So this was something, you know, even after 12 years, I'm still not used to it. (laughs) (laughs) Jennifer, how about you? Uh, When were you diagnosed and, and how do you celebrate Thanksgiving? I was actually diagnosed two days before my 29th birthday, and uh, it was originally diagnosed as type 2. took quite a few years, about six years, to get that corrected to type 1. It's frustrating during that time period. However, uh, Thanksgiving has always ranged in my family. When growing up, it was huge. We had the 50 to 60 people. But anymore, I bounce around. Sometimes it's just me and my parents. Sometimes it's me and my in-laws. This year, it actually happens to be me and my best friend. We are going out to the sand dunes at Glamis for Thanksgiving. Oh, that sounds like fun. Uh, It'll be dirty, but it'll be fun. (laughs) Uh, Stacey, what I did forget to tell you, even though I told you I was diagnosed right before 29th birthday, it has been 13 years. I'm not 33, so it's not been four years. It's been 13 years. (laughs) Naya, how about you? How do you mark the holiday and when were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed in March. Uh, This year has been 10 years living with type 1 diabetes. Usually Thanksgiving is a family affair. Um, When I was a child, it was me and my parents and my siblings. So we're talking like six people max. I have celebrated Thanksgiving very small with just me and my sister, and I've done it with 200 of my closest friends at a hotel. Um, And by closest friends, I mean total strangers. (laughs) (laughs) What was that? What what brought you to a hotel with 200 people? Was it an event? Was it, did you stumble into somebody else's party? (laughs) I, I was. That was the year that I was invited to, to celebrate Thanksgiving with somebody else. And that's what they've always done is they go to the Marriott in downtown Providence and they celebrate Thanksgiving and they don't cook. They just let somebody else do all the cooking and they eat. So that was that year for me. And I was like, Oh, this is different. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Oh no. But just with my family, it's just, you know, small scale of, you know, we cook and call it a day. Mike, how about you? Um, I was diagnosed with type one, uh, 33 years ago in 1984 and I was 16 and pretty much, uh, Thanksgiving is eating and drinking and being merry. Do you have a big, big family celebration or? Uh, it's usually about eight to 20 bigger lately. We've been having my wife's family over, so it works out to about 20 people. Well, Thanksgiving is, is my holiday, and I'll give you my take as, as I said, as the token parent. Um, my, my son was diagnosed before he turned two, and we always have celebrated Thanksgiving at my house because when I started in broadcasting, I always had to work. So I I usually didn't have the holiday off. So my parents or my sister, everybody would come to me and then they would try to figure out when I could get off of work or sneak home. And then as the years went on and I I moved up the ladder a little bit more and then I finally had Thanksgiving off, you know, which is so exciting in my career. But I kept the holiday. So we usually have um, it's pretty small family, about 10 to 14 people at my house. But it's always fun. And this year. We actually have some other holiday, uh, we have some other family celebrations uh, that are close, so nobody's traveling, and so it's just going to be the four of us, and we haven't yet decided what to do. Um, My husband is the cook, and he's like, I'm not cooking for the four of you, so we'll figure (laughs) it out. So with diabetes, I know for me, um, we've changed a lot over the years, because in the beginning, you know, with a two-year-old, I was like, oh, I'm going to eat, and oh my gosh, and now it's like, make sure your cartridge is full, and go eat. But I'm curious to hear your experiences. Anybody have anything? And just, you know, jump right in if you do. Well, back when uh, I was diagnosed, we were taking RNNPH insulin, which was a little bit different in that your morning long-term shot would have a vague peak associated with sometime around lunchtime. But that didn't really work very well for like holidays like Thanksgiving. So I would just kind of keep throwing more R logs on the fire. (laughs) over the course of the day and like have 
at one point it reached where I would like run up and down the stairs like 10 times after having a big shot in my leg to sort of catch up and bridge the from the appetizer round to the main course and then it would crash it in time for dessert so that worked out okay too wow <laughs> see I when I was first diagnosed they put me on the split mix R and NPH as well and so what I ended up doing was nobody actually told me that you could adjust it and give yourself more or less. It was you take a shot in the morning and a shot at night. Right. So when I, my first Thanksgiving, I think I just ran hot and I didn't know better or know enough to, to try to fix it. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to eat. And <laughs> day. <laughs> How do you do it now? Now I um, do a temp rate and I do an extended bolus and I pay attention to what it is that I am eating. I don't deprive myself and I try to take a walk at some point in time during the day, whether it's around the block um, or just around the house a couple of times to have the insulin used a little more efficiently. And, and I'd still call it a day. And I think last year I called it a win because I stayed under 200. So. Oh, I yeah, it's a win. That's awesome. <laughs> that is a win. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I go through this balance of just bring regular food. You know, please don't cook sugar free for my son because that was something that everybody wanted to do right away. You know, let's have real food. But at the same time, I think we all make individual choices. Like, I will eat that, but I'm not going to eat that. You know, I'm going to let him have this, but I, I'll steer away from that. And that can be very confusing to our families. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, does anybody have a strategy? Jennifer, how do you talk to your family? And, and it's had to have been a process as if initially they thought you had type 2. It was a process, especially since I had extended family. I had an aunt who had been type 2 for a good 15, 20 years. So everyone was basing me off of her as well. Mm -hmm. So the first Thanksgiving after diagnosis, I showed up and there was sugar-free everything. And I got the weirdest looks. When I went and grabbed the normal piece of pie, they're like, well, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, I'm eating what I want to eat. <laughs> and it's Thanksgiving. This is what, what I considered it one of my cheat days. When I was originally diagnosed, my doctor told me pick four days a year to still monitor what you're eating, but don't stress over what you're eating. And it, it gave me the freedom to not worry about it. So I, I picked I picked Valentine's Day. I picked my wedding anniversary. I picked <clears throat> my birthday. And Thanksgiving, since Thanksgiving was a food-related holiday anyway. And so Excellent. I, yeah, and, and it helped because I knew I could have that ridiculously tall piece of German chocolate cake and it wasn't going to kill me. I would probably feel miserable, one, because that's a really big, huge piece of German chocolate cake, <laughs> but I, I would still, I'd still be okay. The family... That was always fun. I, I'd get the looks. I'd get the, you shouldn't. I'd get the, I made this for you. And then I'd feel guilted into having to eat the sugar-free whatever because it was made for me instead of just because they wanted to. So I have something similar. When I was introduced to my husband's family, I was actually brought in by another type 1. So the first Thanksgiving I attended she made a sugar-free dessert. And so I remember that I partook in that. But up until that point in my family, like, I would just have a little bit of the real thing. I never did sugar-free. Actually, that's not true. I I do sugar-free pudding <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> and that's about the only thing I do sugar-free. So the first Thanksgiving, she made it a point to let me know that she had brought a sugar-free dessert. And I thought, well, how am I going to handle this? And I did the polite thing for like three or four years. And then it got to the point where I was like, I'm not doing this. There's 12 pies in the kitchen and I don't <laughs> want the sugar-free cherry pie. Like I don't like cherry. Like, <laughs> um, And I remember the first Thanksgiving, I sort of, you know, stepped over the I line, will. if you will. <laughs> um, I walked into the kitchen and like I said, like there's like sometimes 40 people there. I walked into the kitchen. I got a piece of whatever normal pie I got. And as I was walking out, someone stopped me and they said, oh, Kim, didn't you see that so-and-so brought you a sugar-free dessert? And I just looked at them and I just very politely said, yes, I did know that, but I really wanted a little bit of chocolate cream pie or whatever it was. <laughs> So the next year, I prepared a statement in my head 
over and over for like two weeks. <laughs> I stressed out about this. What am I going to say if someone says something to me? And I just decided that Thanksgiving not to eat dessert because I thought, you know, this is not a battle I want to even face, right? Like, it's not worth it. I'll wait and I'll go to my mom's house tomorrow and eat a piece of pecan pie. Like, <laughs> and the type one that was also there came into the room I was in and handed me a brownie and basically shoved it in my mouth and was like, oh, try this. And I was like, okay. So I took a bite of it and I just kind of looked at her and I, and I was like, this is sugar free, isn't it? And I was so mad because I allowed someone to sort of corner me into doing something that like, because she was just trying to prove a point. So the next year <laughs> I had my statement prepared and I believe um, I got a piece of regular pie and someone said something to me about it and my husband said Kim has worked very hard to learn how to use her insulin pump and she knows how to count carbs and correct for whatever she wants to eat and I was like oh my goodness wow, like somebody's damn, paying they attention <laughs> hello and, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I don't worry about it because honestly, like, I think it, it does give me anxiety every year because I think, OK, like, who's going to say something to wow. me? And I know in my heart I really shouldn't care. But at the same time, I do try to make it uh, a point to sort of educate as well. You know, I'm not upset with this other person who has diabetes because in all honesty, like everybody is different in terms of what they do. Sure. So. I don't do the sugar free stuff like she does, you know, and I think, too, there's a difference between like generations, you know, like people who were diagnosed, let's say, 30 years ago, even. Wait, Mike, you said you've had it for 33 years. right? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. Uh, so let's say 40 years ago, you know, they might not feel as comfortable sort of counting carbs and that kind of stuff. So they might have a different train of thought in terms of what they can do. Yeah. But Kim, you know, how I, important was it that your husband, it's his family. I mean, it's your family right. too. Now you married in, but it's, it's so important to have that spouse to be able to say, look, my people, this is my right. new person. <laughs> and she knows what she's doing. It's, well, it's, it's great that he did that. I think he just saw how much stress it caused me every year. And like, let's face it, it's the whole month of November sometimes that we're worried about this is for me, at least, like, mm -hmm. how am I going to handle this situation? So to know that there was someone else, but that took time to sort of like, educating the people around us, you know what I mean? Like, right. so yes. it took a few years of us having this discussion. And because it's kind of the same crowd a couple times a year at different family events. So it doesn't just have to be about Thanksgiving dessert, it might be summertime family party dessert. And so he just saw me really struggle with that. And now I guess we don't even really talk about it because, again, now it's been so long and everyone has seen me that they don't question what I'm doing. That's great. Now, well, one of the things on. I did with educating people is, one, I would always say that I counted the carbs. One year I brought a tub of regular Cool Whip and a tub of sugar-free Cool Whip. And if any of you have ever looked at the labels on them, the sugar-free Cool Whip actually has more carbs in it than the regular. Yep. And that's what I pointed out to everyone. I'm like, look, just because it's sugar-free doesn't mean that it's carb-free. And that's what I have to worry about. That's what I have to concern myself with and count. So if I'm going to have to count, give me something that's going to taste better and be healthier and less chemicals in the first place. No, okay, so Cool Whip is all chemicals. I understand that. But it, it, was a perfect <laughs> example showing, it was a perfect example showing that sugar-free oftentimes will actually have more carbs than the regular. And Naya, I wanted to uh, come back to you if I could. Have you had these kinds of experiences? I have not. My family has, has been extremely open and supportive in the sense that if I tell them that I want to eat regular pie, my mom's like, okay. It's kind of, they've sort of... Seeing as how I was diagnosed when I was 21, they kind of let me run my diabetes. And so when I tell them I want regular pie, it's not a question of, oh, did you have that? It's a, it's in the kitchen, go help yourself kind of deal. And even when we have family or we go out with other people, 
the assumption is always, well, she knows what she's doing. So if she wants to have two slices of regular pie, nobody at this table is going to say anything. <laughs> What's the best Thanksgiving dessert you've had, Naya? Was it at the Marriott or was it at somebody's no, house? <laughs> it's, <laughs> Marriott is fantastic, but um, homemade is always best. I think my absolute favorite Thanksgiving dessert is a well-made sweet potato pie. Mm, um, cool. So with real whipped cream on top. Um, and typically I make it myself, not to toot my own horn, but toot toot. So <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to Naya's for Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Extra on, big slices here. Celebrating with my parents. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mike, you've said, you know, that you see Thanksgiving as a time to really celebrate and drink and be married. How did you get to that point? You know, you have lived with diabetes uh, for a long time. And I, I don't know that, I don't know your family. I don't know that you were drinking when you were 16 or, you know, when you were younger. No, nah, <laughs> at family events anyway. But how did you get to that point? I mean, how did you get, you know. Like two you... years later than I was. <laughs> mind, but, um, I mean, I just, I was actually diagnosed after, like in January, although I don't know the exact day because I didn't keep track or whatever. But uh, so there's like pictures of myself from like Thanksgiving looking really ghastly before that. But then I had like a year to sort of get into it and figure out how to manage stuff. And, and like Naya I and mean, my family were always just like, you know, just take care of it. You're doing it. And I mean, by numerous uh, speed bumps along the way or whatever, but it was just like, you know, what's your blood sugar? What do you need? As opposed to, can you eat that? And I mean, everybody's been pretty open about saying, you know, everybody loads your own plate up. So if I want four pounds of mashed potatoes because I'm low, then I'll have four pounds of mashed potatoes because I'm low. And if I'm high, I'm only going to have a half a cup of mashed potatoes. I'm only going to have half a cup of mashed potatoes. It's whatever. It's my thing. And you don't have any issues in your family anymore with people asking you, should you eat that? Uh, no. No, they pretty much. I mean, I don't recall them ever really doing that. It was more like about the timing of stuff. You know, where's your blood sugar? You know, again, with the aria you had to wait like a long time for it to kick in so you know i'd be banging away merrily the whole time <laughs> do you remember switching to the the faster acting did that really change yeah yeah it was 2008 so it wasn't that long oh. ago i imagine it's changing more than thanksgiving i mean it's kind of silly just oh, to ask yeah. you about that but... no and learning about carb counting and i was kind of carb counting winging it and just been like, oh, that looks like about five units that looks like about 10 units and maybe we'll go seven and a half units for that to like, well, that looks like about 400 grams of carbs, so I'll bowl this for 500 grams of carbs and have dessert. You know, it's it's funny because we all have families, I would imagine, where, you know, there's more going on than, than type 1 diabetes. As has already been mentioned, you know, there's people with type 2. There's people who are trying to watch their weight or lose weight. There are people, you know, who you may know in your family have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. But, you know, we don't look at them the same way around the table, right? Nobody's saying... Well, you know, Harv, I know you have to take high blood pressure medication should you be eating those mashed potatoes. <laughs> you know, what do you think it is about diabetes that makes people, because I think they're, I think for most, at least in my experience, they've been very well-meaning. And maybe it's because it's a kid in my case. You know, my family's watched my son go from this tiny two-year-old to this giant 12-year-old who's taller than everybody. But I think they're well-meaning. But at the same time, you know, we don't, we don't single out other conditions like we do with diabetes. Any thoughts on that? I think it's because diabetes is so food related mm. in the sense like there's carbs in almost everything if you think about it that way. But if you've got a family member, for example, with hypertension and they're watching their salt intake, that's something that's reasonably that's more, at least from a culinary standpoint, is easier to control. Like you have to put you don't have to, but. But, I mean, carbs in bread, carbs in mashed potatoes, carbs in stuffing, it's everywhere. Whereas, you know, omit the salt and Uncle Harold is fine. Hmm. So it's more, I think diabetes is more visibly food oriented. And it also, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions that we all work diligently to correct in that sense, too, as to what you can and cannot eat. I just remember a couple of years ago, too, and that's a great point. But there was this commercial that they were trying to, I can't remember if it was cholesterol or what, but it was, you know, it could be your high cholesterol is because of the you know, fettuccine Alfredo you ate last night or your uncle Alfredo, you know, and they were trying to tie right. like food to genetics and, and it didn't really seem to take off. But I thought that was such a clever way of acknowledging the food, but also acknowledging that, you know, you don't have all the power over these conditions. And I, you know, I just, I don't know if that message got through. It made me laugh. 
I refer to it all the time when I was a health reporter. And uh, I loved that commercial. Yeah. I remember that one. And it made me laugh because it was so, so very true in absolutely every aspect, be it diabetes, be it your high cholesterol, be it even arthritis. It's, you know, it may be because you went skydiving and kept crashing through the trees that you've damaged your body, or it may be because, you know, you, your family tree, not the, the crash into the trees. So yeah, I remember that commercial and I love that. But even that being said, sometimes our families are, are judgier than those out and around us because they do have our best interest or they try to believe that they have our best interest in heart. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, nobody says, nobody can be nicer or nastier than families. I mean, and we're talking about oh. <laughs> with love, right? With love. <laughs> right. Oh, they, they, that's not, that's a, best statement of the year i'll put it that way so (laughs) any advice for um adults with type one who are you know newer diagnosed who like kim you know the month of november you're thinking about this what am i going to say how am i going to handle this you know any any advice should they have a conversation ahead of time should you wait i i found really and truthfully it was helpful for me to like already have in my mind a statement that I could say, like a blanket statement, because then I just felt like I was prepared, that I wasn't going to get caught off guard by someone. And it might sound silly, but it, it really did help me so that I wasn't having anxiety about the situation, especially if it's like a new situation or something where, like I said, every year um, is kind of the same, you know, mm-hmm. song and dance around dessert time, especially. Mm-hmm. So I felt more prepared. And even though the one year I had a little snafu and got fed a force fed a brownie. <laughs> That's so weird. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Who does that? Very, oh, yeah. Well, I'm we, so won't we won't mention names there. Yeah. on this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I really felt like that pre- prepared me um, for it. What was the Other, statement that you, what, what right, were you thinking that you were going to say? Yeah. No. And it was exactly what Dan said, which was just that, you know, I've worked really hard to learn how to, it's something to the effect of I've worked really hard to learn how to use the tools, the carb count to cover, you know, the carbs I'm eating with my insulin pump. And, you know, I can basically have just, I can have it what anyone else can have. You know, I just have to make sure that I'm counting correctly for it. And this is not even with Thanksgiving. If some, my response, if someone says to me, well, should you be having that? My response is always, well, should you? Like, I'm no different than you. Should we all be eating two slices of chocolate cream pie? (laughs) Right. No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't just from a health standpoint, like diabetes or no diabetes, you know, so I'm not different from anyone else. It's about portion control. And and also just maybe saying something like what Jennifer was saying, like that she gets to have a day where she's not going to worry about like what she's eating. You know what I mean? Like this is a day where I give myself, you know, um, permission to eat dessert you know it's it's one day a year that my mom makes this amazing pecan pie and i'm gonna have a slice of it and then i'm gonna take the rest of it home and eat it for breakfast for the next yeah. week. <laughs> that a girl. that's great how about you mike any advice you've been at this a long time um yeah i mean it's you know when we're hosting it's like running around all day doing work and i've We'll try to do the turkey trot and come home and make mashed potatoes and then eat the mashed potatoes while I'm cooking the turkey. So and wait, you're gonna you just you run, run like a turkey trot is a run. Is a I have in the past. I haven't signed up yet this year, but yeah, I mean I always do those kind of things. Okay. So just being I'm weird. just busy, so then I don't have time to worry about it. So I just keep you know keep an eye on things with the CGM and see what happens. Just like the rest of the time. How do you like to make your turkey? Are you a fryer, a briner? Are you? How do you do it? On the oven. Um, I, <laughs> with the America's Test Kitchen, uh, had a way of doing it, like cooking it on pretty high heat for like half an hour, flip it, half an hour, flip it, half an hour, and then roasting it. And it came out like perfectly. So uh, that's what we're going to do again this year. Very nice. Very nice. Yep. Naya, any, any advice from you that you'd like to share? My advice is to keep a large glass of water next to you. I have sort of started to take over the cooking responsibilities, and I find that I grab my favorite. It's a large Steelers cup. Go Steelers. 
And that is my water cup for the day. And as long as I've filled it at least three times, no matter what my blood sugar is doing, at least I know I'm hydrated, which always helps whether you're high or low. And I, that's kind of my go-to is just make sure that I've got my water cup. <laughs> that's really smart. That is really smart. Yeah. yeah. I like that. How about you, Jennifer? My recommendation is, one, learn how to use your pump. I remember the first Thanksgiving that I had my pump, I had heard, hey, do the combo bolus. That way, you figure it out. Do a good chunk right up front and then extend it out so you can graze better. Well, I thought I knew everything, and I didn't read how to do this ridiculous combo <laughs> bolus at first, and I did it wrong. And I was low really, really quick. So, of course, I was inhaling everything and not enjoying mm. what I was eating and then ended up super high later. And did I tell anyone? No, because, one, I was embarrassed that I didn't know what I was doing. And, two, I didn't want to bother anyone. It, it was me. It was my error. And I just ran with it. I dealt with it. And I'm still here, so that's what counts. But that was my <laughs> recommendation <laughs> is, to, if you're using a pump and you're going to do something like that, learn exactly what it does yeah. so you can be prepared and not have to stress on that one at the last minute. That's a great idea because it sounds funny, but, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but as a parent, we learned how to use the pump with my two and a half year old running around the room and squirming and, you know, whatever. And it took me several years to actually understand how things like a combo bolus really worked, how temp basal rates really worked. Um, and so I always tell anybody I meet who's new on a pump is just use the basics. And then three months later, now that you know how to use it, read the instruction book again, because there's all these features you probably don't even know are there. It's a little different yeah, as an adult. I had gotten my pump literally on November 1st that year oh, wow. and went live with it November 8th. So I had two weeks on a pump before I decided to try to be all nice. advanced and do the combo bullets. It was a humbling experience. <laughs> I also tell parents, and, and I don't know how you all feel about this, whenever I have to go into a new situation, I tell my son, although now he's almost 13 and he's like, whatever, mom, I don't need to tell him anything anymore. He knows everything. Um, but I tell him, you know, it's a science experiment. So starting a new sport, science experiment, we're going to have some ups, downs, you know, but we're going to figure it out. And I have found it's helpful to share that with family, that perspective, like, look, we're new at this. This is our first Thanksgiving. Or, you know, we, we did Thanksgiving last year, but he was honeymooning. Or, you know, we were on shots, now we're on a pump. Science experiment. We're going to try it this way and see how it goes. And that way, there's a little bit of the pressure off where you're not trying to hit a goal. You're not trying to be perfect. You're not trying to stay in this perfect range. Um, you're just trying to enjoy the day. And the success is always, like somebody said, you know, I made it, I'm here. But also, you know, did you enjoy Thanksgiving? Did you enjoy your family? Because if we're so worried about staying, you know, at a flat Dexcom line or, you know, not spiking up for 10 minutes, what's the point? You know, you got to be with family and have fun and fall asleep watching football. I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's uh, it's hard. And I say that, big talker, but of course, every time we have a big meal, I'm always like, oh, no, are you going to eat all of that? Don't forget to bolus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just how it goes. But I think, um, and Mike alluded to this a minute ago, that CGM technology has really helped. Mm. Because when I was first diagnosed and first through Thanksgiving, A, I was on, you know, the two shots a day, but I had no idea where my blood sugar was trending. So now I wake up Thanksgiving morning and I'm like, I'm good to go. I know exactly where, what, I have a good idea of where my blood sugar is. I have a good idea of where it's going. Um, I know whether or not I've counted correctly or at least am in a general direction of, of doing things that are going to um, result in, you know, a day that's not spent super high or super low. As we start to wrap this up, um, and it, it, you guys have been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Mike, you know, we haven't really talked about alcohol. And oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> any, any recommendation for a Thanksgiving cocktail? Do you have anything on the regular there? Um, no, I think we're probably going to make, like, grapefruit margaritas or something I've heard. Nice. Maybe. Or, you know, just have a bar set up. And, you know, and again, it's like if I'm running low, I have a grapefruit margarita. If I'm running high, I have a whiskey. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of, I imagine, having a kid who's not of drinking age yet, there's a lot to figure yeah. out that way. Does that factor into how you eat that day? Uh, no. 
<laughs> no, the food is just like eat the food, and it's really I don't like do the combo boluses. I just do bolus and bolus and bolus, which leads to a lot of stacking. But for me, that works better in that kind of environment. Fifteen grams of carbs per appetizer plate, maybe in the ballpark. But if it starts cruising up, and that's again like Naya said, the CGM technology and using it and looking like every 10 minutes to see, okay, what did that thing do? Maybe it takes a while to get yeah. going, but then you see when it starts to blast off before you even start carving the turkey. And then you're like, okay, I got to red line the basil and throw some more Novo logs or Huma logs on the fire or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> just keep after it, you know, and it's more, it leads to a better outcome at the end of the evening when you're doing the dishes, you're still not like 400 or something. You might be 200, which is way better, not better, but you know, it's more, yeah easy to get right. back to normal. Well, right. And again, with the science experiment, what we have found quite often is that if it's a higher fat meal, not even doing a combo bolus helps my son putting a, an, a very high temp basil helps mm -hmm. quite yeah. a bit for three to four hours. Uh, that really helps with something like this. I think also I struggle with gastroparesis mm. and Thanksgiving, which is when I say I struggle, it's more that um, especially when you're going to like a big family meal, you don't really have a lot of control over like what sides there are going to be or how the turkey is cooked or whatnot. So I think that for me, having gastroparesis and diabetes, like it's just a stressful day in general around food. So I have a hard time with that. And I tend to eat very blandly and then we have a small family Thanksgiving on Sunday after Thanksgiving Sheesh. where I eat whatever I want. <laughs> I think food is just a struggle in general for me and diabetes and gastroparesis. And can I just jump in and, and correct me if I get this wrong, but gastroparesis is when the stomach empties very slowly. It's a, it's yeah. a digestive issue. It's a digestive issue, but it's also from like start to finish. So the vagus nerve yeah, it's a is nerve paralyzed. Ah. Yeah. And so high fat foods, high fiber, basically anything that's good for you as a person with diabetes, like low carb, that kind of stuff, you can't digest. Oh, jeez. So it's a struggle. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I'm definitely not that familiar with it. And I'm, I know you're not alone with that. So thank you yeah. um, for sharing that. And um, I have to ask, is there anything... Is there a treatment? Is there a way, you know, any advice for people who have it? Or is it something you just have to kind of learn how your body responds? It depends on sort of the severity of your gastroparesis. Personally, I've tried different medications such as Raglan, Domperidone. There's nothing to reverse that complication. There really isn't a good treatment for it. Um, basically, I control it with my diet, mm. eating small, frequent meals, meals that are easily digestible. So it's not a pleasant complication because like, you know, you want to eat healthy foods, but if you can't digest them, right, it's horrible. I bet that sugar-free cherry pie was really good for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Just All right. Give me some, like, I don't know, broccoli and uh, some raisins. And that'll be a great thing. <laughs> All right. So as we, uh, as we wrap this up uh, and, and head out to, uh, you know, Thanksgiving this week, Anybody have any favorites? I mean, for me, my mother makes a sweet potato casserole, and over the years, she's made it sugar-free, with sugar. You know, she tried with Splenda, with the marshmallows, without. And it's just, it's not Thanksgiving without that dish, however she makes it. Because my mom makes it. You know, it's just one of those things that we have to have. I'll put you all on the spot. And, and Naya, I'll start with you. Is, is it the, the pie you were talking about? No. it's My dad makes ham, and he mm. only makes it twice a year. Thanksgiving and Christmas. So for me, it's it's Dad's ham. And awesome. If you don't have that, it's not Thanksgiving. Although the pie is pretty good too, but it's <laughs> it's ham. <laughs> Jennifer, oh goodness. Um, other than just the food in general, because it's there and massive. One year I attempted horribly attempted the cauliflower mashed potato replacement, mm. and it was the runniest, nastiest stuff I'd ever had in my life. So for me, it has to be actual, true, lumpy 
creamy, but with the lumps, real mashed potatoes. And if I don't have a very large portion, I mean, Mike, you said four pounds of mashed potatoes, and I'm thinking, well, maybe two. But <laughs> if I don't have the, the the mashed potatoes, it just isn't. It, it's just not Thanksgiving. Mike, how about you? Probably the gravy, because my mom and uncle would always have a debate about making the gravy because my mom would make roux and my uncle would use like a brown blender thing to go and grind it up <laughs> and, re- and it's okay but i'm kind of into making it with the roux too like my mom and so that's fun that's funny and last and- year we made a huge turkey that has a ton of juice so it came out very well yum and kim yeah. well i keep talking about my mom's pecan pie it's actually my great grandmother's recipe uh, and i've never ooh. had it like no one has ever made it the same way other than my family who has the recipe but I love it so much that the first year I was away at college I couldn't come home for Thanksgiving and my mom like she shipped me a piece of pie and I'm pretty sure it wasn't overnight shipping so I'm not quite sure I should have been (laughs) eating it but I just relished in that like one piece of pie (laughs) oh that's great that's yeah, the it's ultimate Thanksgiving without it. <laughs> That's the ultimate. Should you be eating that? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's great. Well, Kim and Mike and Naya and Jennifer, thank you for sharing this with us. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody's turkey and ham is delicious and <laughs> that, you know, everything is bolus worthy. So thanks for being with me. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. That is love, putting dessert in the mail. I bet some of you have done that. Man, that was fun. They were great. So happy that they came on to talk to me. I'm going to try to do more of that if you enjoyed that. I thought it was kind of neat to hear from different people about how they manage because everybody does do this differently. Okay, so let me tell you. I'll probably regret this. Let me tell you about some of the wacko stuff that happened to me in broadcasting. Because as I said way back earlier in the show, that I always had to work on Thanksgiving. Uh, My first job in broadcasting was as a TV reporter in Utica, New York. I worked at WUTR for six months. And then I worked at WKTV for about two, maybe three years. And um, these were just two small TV stations. And, um, you know, like most stations, everybody does everything. So I was a reporter uh, for the first six months at that one station. And then I was the um, main anchor at the age of like 22 or 23, which is hysterical, at the other station in town. And, um, and actually that's where I met my husband, but that's another story altogether. And we would go out and do, um, remote broadcasts at the mall or any location like you do. You know, you're just looking for action and, and live shots and talking to people. And so on Thanksgiving, my whole family came up to my apartment and, uh, they were making dinner and waiting for me to come home. And I wish I could remember where we ate because I remember having a table that sat two people. But, um, I did have a pretty large apartment, but I had this tiny table. So we probably just ate on couches and all over the place. I mean, large for a recent college student. So I don't remember that part, but the food was great, but they were all watching TV to see me doing what I was supposed to be doing on Thanksgiving. And I, it was probably a preview of Black Friday, right? The shopping and all that. So that's why we were at the mall. I don't remember any of it because all I remember is doing a talk back with the anchors. And you've seen this a million times. We're going to go live now to Stacy at the mall. Hey, Stacy, what's going on there? What's the feeling in the air? You know, or whatever they say. And they're like, hi, guys, I'm here at the Shopping Town Mall talking to people about what's the hot ticket for the holiday season, you know, or whatever you're, you're doing. And we, we did that. I interviewed people. I'm sure we ran a story that I had taped previously. But in the background of my live shot for at least two, maybe three minutes, I have no idea this is going on, is a dancing taco. It's a guy, maybe it was a girl, dressed up, you know what I'm talking about, right? In a taco costume for a restaurant in the mall. I I hope, I, I don't remember what it was for. Dressed up like a taco, dancing like a fool, but making me look like a fool because I didn't know what was going on behind me. And I'll be honest with you, at that age, I have no idea what I would have done. So I'm really glad I didn't know the taco was behind me because now, you know, I would grab the taco or well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't grab the taco. 
I would just talk to the taco. I don't know. We need to move on. But it was so embarrassing. And it was so funny. And my parents were like, really, this is what we sent you to college for? Very nice. After several years, I worked my way up. And I remember the first time I actually had Thanksgiving off was, it was about 10 years later, actually. It was while I was working in radio. And that was a treat to be able to have the holiday off. So if you're working on Thanksgiving, I wish you the best. May you avoid dancing tacos. And if you have the day off, I hope you enjoy it as well. Oh, my goodness. All right, let's move on to Shop Talk. Shop Talk is the segment where we bring you vendors and exhibitors from conventions because it's tough to get to these conventions, I know, but there's a lot of really good stuff that goes on there. One of the exhibitors I met there was Tempermed, and they make cooling products that um, are intended to keep sensitive medications cool, medications like insulin. So they have this, I believe it's pronounced VV cap, and it is a replacement cap for your insulin pen. They also have uh, vials. They have um, Epi for EpiPen. Uh, it's really interesting, and it's more than keeping it at room temperature. This is an Israeli company, and I will let the president of Tempermed, Ron Nager, explain it further. Tempermed, we developed a device that keeps the temperature of the insulin at a proper temperature uh, irrespective of the ambient temperature. We try to do that without uh, any intervention from the user. So the device basically works by itself. You don't put it in the freezer? You don't yeah. have to. Well, we have two versions. Okay. There is a version that is intended to keep the insulin at room temperature, and you don't have to put it in the freezer, you don't have to put it in the refrigerator, you don't have to put it in water, and you don't have to charge it. It's self-charging by itself, Whenever the ambient temperature is below 80, the uh, device re-energizes. And if by mistake you left it in your car, the insulin, the pen, or the vial, uh, we have tested the device uh, to keep the insulin below 80, even if it's uh, exposed to a temperature of 100 degrees, for almost 15 hours. 15 hours? 15 hours. So, basically, you can... Once you start using the insulin, take it out from the refrigerator, put it in the device. If it's a, it's a cap, all you have to do is replace the pen cap with this cap, and that's it. If, it, if you have a vial, just put the vial inside the VV vial, and that's it. You don't have to do anything more. And what about the other product that's the freezer? Well, the, uh, we have uh, two other products that keeps the insulin at refrigerator temperature. And that's for cases when you're traveling and you want to take the extra unopened vial or unused pen with you, and you want to, then you have to keep it refrigerated. So these two will keep the device or the insulin refrigerated for 24 hours. Then uh, it gives you enough time to go back and put it in a refrigerator in another place. These are energized by putting it them in the refrigerator. Can they go through airport security? Yes. Are you? Okay, so they're yes. allowed through TSA no, and all that No stuff. problem. Um, how recent are the products? I apologize, I haven't heard uh, of we start, Yeah, we started the uh, activity in March this year. So it's a brand new product. These are all brand new products. Uh, selling now in Australia, in the US, uh, uh, Europe, in Germany, Spain, uh, in Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia where it's hot. Uh, now we are uh, also discussing with distributors in India, uh, China, and South Africa. So how did you come up with the idea for it? Are you touched by diabetes or was it something else? Or? Well, yeah, I've been working in th this field for almost 20 years now. I uh, started with uh, non-invasive blood developing devices for to make life easier for people uh, living with diabetes. Um, started with a non-invasive blood glucose monitoring uh, device and I had a developed a d product for that uh, which did not get to the market, unfortunately. And then uh, I had another device that improved the insulin absorption, and now I came up with this uh, product. 
More information on Tempramed at diabetes-connections.com and of course in the show notes. Very interesting product. There are some new products out there, a couple of them now about cooling insulin and especially with pens, um, keeping them at the right temperature. So you can find out more about that. Another company I wanted to talk about this week in Shop Talk is Drawn from Valor. And this is not necessarily a diabetes company, just like Tempermed doesn't just uh, make insulin products, but they have really found that they enjoy the community, as they told me. And Drawn from Valor creates comic books and animation products for nonprofits. So here is Todd Silverstein. We're an animation studio. We help other nonprofits develop animations, illustrations, that sort of thing. So you're not a diabetes animation company? That's correct. Yeah, we have another project that deals with PTSD in a family setting called The Tales of the Golden Acorn. It's be released summer 2018. So what, what is this story? So this is a story about Kara and the dire beastie, the not-so-dire beastie, actually. <laughs> and so Kara is recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and she's exhibiting some of the signs and symptoms. She's in class. They're learning about the body. She falls asleep, and she goes through this adventure, a dream adventure, where she's searching um, for a, a key to unlock the cells in her body that insulin serves as a key to unlock the cells in your body. And she goes through, and she tries to find um, this key. Oh, coming across um, all these characters along the way, such as Sir Ranch. It's a knight that helps her and anyway it's a very uh, fun interactive story that um, goes across the whole span of this how, how did you all come up with it like what was the uh, impetus for this so um so my mom's actually a um pete's endo doc at shans and i was at a semi-retirement party for her and one of her fellows was there who's the brainchild behind this whole project dr angelina bernier and uh she was talking about the project. I mentioned that we're an animation studio that works with nonprofits, and it sort of went from there. So That's great. Um, and what has the reception been? It's been really good. Actually, um, you know, diabetes educators, children, a lot of people have expressed a lot of enthusiasm for the project. It's actually um, part of an interactive ebook that's um, this a larger project that Dr. Bernier is doing, and that as as well has received a lot of positive feedback. We're really excited about the potential here. It's going to be free, actually. So University of Florida is the primary people behind this, and they're going to offer it online on a website and via downloadable apps for Android and iOS. Yeah, so we're looking for a release date around, I think, early 2018. So what's that like for you, that your mom, you know, kind of made this all happen? Yeah, it's kind of neat. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of my mom. So I never thought I'd be involved in anything related to diabetes. So this is actually really kind of special for me. And you can see more. Um, I will link up a lot of information about Drawn from Valor in the show notes, just like everything else we talked about. Although I realize as I'm, I'm talking um, about show notes, unfortunately, I have no video of the dancing taco. So if you're from Utica, New York, and you happen to be watching WKTV in about 1993 or 94, and you snapped a picture of your television, or perhaps you were the dancing taco, drop me a line, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. Talk about a can of worms. Oh, you go vault. Speaking of uh, television from the early 90s, though, boy, how's that for a segue? I did post the pictures I had talked about last week. Um, my former co-anchor, Jeff Glore, who's now on CBS Network News, I did post the pictures of us from way back when in the Facebook group. So if you want to see those, you can jump on over there and check them out. Again, it's Diabetes Connections the group on Facebook. And I, when I found those pictures, I actually found a lot of old media pictures from the 90s and from the early 2000s when I worked in television here in Charlotte. So we may have some more fun stuff to put those pictures out. Uh, maybe we'll have some contests or some goals or something because I can't just hand them over. They're way too embarrassing. So please go ahead and join the group. If you like the show, please share it with somebody touched by type 1 diabetes. That is the best way to spread the word and get that great advice. I mean, that Thanksgiving roundtable, I think they had such good advice for getting through Thanksgiving. And some of those stories, man, it's hard to believe that that happens. But we've all been in those weird situations, right? Eat this, try that, or don't eat this, or I made this for you. And I'm thrilled that they came on. So if you think it's going to be helpful for someone, please share it. 
and let me know. Huge thank you to my editor, John Buchanis from Audio Editing Solutions. He is a master and makes the show sound much better than it has any right to be. And thank you as you listen. Uh, Spending an hour with you each week is a huge privilege for me. It is so nice to know that we have this hour together a group of people who really just get it. I have some great stuff coming up before the end of the year and already have some new things on tap for January. I can't believe we're talking about 2018, but let's not rush it. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Best to you, to yours, safe travels, yummy food, terrific numbers, and a lot to be thankful for. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.